speakers. Um, this is a talk that has been grown and modified, been modified several times. Um, I have a stiff timekeeping piece to do. Uh, the most recent few times I've done this, it's been over an hour, so we don't want to go there. Because I'm between you and getting uh, some refreshments and so on. But if I go too fast, for God's sake, this is interactive. The real presenters here, nothing virtual. Um, you should immediately say, hold it, go back, do that again. But we're going to talk about the future of microprocessors, by which, of course, I mean I'm going to talk about the future of microprocessors with copious examples from the past. <laughs> I mean, examples from the future is actually quite hard. <laughs> Um, I have a wireless mouse thingy which hopefully I'll be able to use. So the talk structured around two very famous laws, um, but we're also going to delve into all sorts of other things. The talk is fairly technical, there are graphs. <laughs> so the first law, which is kind of the obvious one, is well, it's not a law. He made an observation that he looked at the rate at which number of transistors on a piece of silicon was increasing over time and said so, right we can we can plot a straight line graph of that and when he originally proposed it it was the number of transistors doubles every 18 months every three years you've got four times as many transistors on the same piece of silicon same area of silicon um, uh, it had a bumpy ride for a while and they rewrote the law the silicon valley napkin it was written on was torn up and it was redrafted as every two years you get twice as many transistors. And the, the so called law is now a self fulfilling prophecy um, because the law is taken as the driving force for the development of silicon processors for making things. So the ITRS, the International uh, Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, who guide the development of future silicon processors at all the places that still make transistors, um, take the law and say, it has to be fulfilled. What do we do now to make that happen? What technology do we have to deploy? What weird materials do we have to get into? Um, we can see that over the past 30 years, 40 years, it has actually held quite well. That is a remarkably straight graph in a world where not much is straight. Um, we've used a lot of transistors to make things go faster. Because I got the graph from American sources, uh, ARM isn't on here, and the blue dots are Intel, the red dots are Motorola, whatever happens to them. Um, uh, it gets very blue at the top right, as inevitably it must do. Um, log scale on the left, linear scale on the right, so that's how to convey the doubling as a graph. So, it, remarkably, it has been possible to do this. What does it mean? Um, we, 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 you know, for, from oh, this point on the graph, 8286, 8386, these things have executed the same instruction set going forwards. So they've used a lot of transistors to make increasingly complex versions of the same instruction set processor. Well, that's one way you can use a lot of transistors, but there are other ways. Um, another way to visualize the graph is to draw the same functionality. So on the wall behind me is a plot of the original 3 micron arm 1. In my right hand is a small piece of paper on the small piece of paper is a black dot. The black dot contains a plot to the same scale of a modern day Cortex M0 plus. And that's the rough modeling equivalent of, a, of the original R1. So, pretty dramatic. It's 70,000 times scale change for the same functionality. Well, we designed this thing by hand and made the transistors out perfectly, but that was done by a silicon compiler. So, probably have done slightly better. So, incredible change in what you can deploy 
the small black dot obviously runs faster because the small transistors are better as well. Let's go back in time. What do you get for transistors? I'm, I design microprocessor instruction sets for a living and for a profit. And what do you get for 4,000 transistors? Well, on the left is a die shot of the 6502. It's built out of silicon and metals. The colours are diffraction. Well, diffraction and refraction. So as we shine a light into a piece of silicon, um, we get refraction effects. Metal grids cause diffraction effects. So all the colours on these sorts of shot are entirely uh, created by those processes. If you took a picture normally, it would just be a sort of copper coloured ingot of stuff. Um, you have to go a long way. On the right hand side is the circuit diagram of a 6502. And we've distorted the circuit diagram so the transistors are topologically in the same place as they are on the actual chip. Okay? So we won't do much more because as the number of transistors goes up, drawing circuit diagrams for things gets rather impractical. But you can see this big yellowy area at the bottom. That's the 6502's instruction decoder, and that corresponds to this part of the circuit diagram, which is the instruction decoder PLA as a schematic. The two PLA layers, black and white dots, meaning ones or noughts in the main PLA. Um, up at the top, we have the data path of the 6502, and in the middle, all the control logic. So, as I say, we, we won't be doing it by the circuit diagram as we go forward, we'll be doing it by a schematic diagram. The schematic diagram of the 6502 is on the right, it's a lot simpler than the circuit diagram. Basically, you get a set of blocks connected by buses. Pretty much all schematic diagrams of the microprocessor that look like that and camouflage practically every part of the intent of what one might mean. Um, in this we have things like accumulators, we have buses carrying things around the place, um, addresses going around and so on. Um, it's still probably a bit complicated as we get more complicated microprocessors, we'll find that that diagram gets simpler. Um, the more complicated the processor is, the less easy it is to explain just what is going on in there, and we draw simpler diagrams to compensate. The theme in the talk will concentrate on the words on the left. So what do we get for 4,000 transistors? We get something that has a fairly simple in-order microarchitecture, um, the 6502 was almost pipelined, but not quite. Um, it could execute um, a 16-bit instruction, which it read as two 8-bit quantities, in the time it took to read it into itself. That was a good deal faster than some other processors of the time took. Um, so an 8-bit operation, which is all it did, um, Add with carry immediate 9, that was 16 bit instruction, to one microsecond or two clock ticks. It read the add with carry in on the first, it read the 9 in on the second, and in the third, when it was reading the next opcode in, it actually did the add with carry 9. So it was just one level pipeline. Um, it had uh, a program count which was 16 bits and three 8 bit registers and it was still 21 square millimetre in size because it was built on this gigantic 6 micron process. Now, I always qualify it by saying 6 micron smallest feature size, but in fact there's nothing in a 6 micron process that is drawn as small as 6 microns across. The transistor's substantially bigger than the thing that we call the smallest feature size. The, small, the, the name we give to a process, like we say 28 nanometer, Everything in a 28 nanometer transistor is far larger than 28 nanometers. Um, it's almost the, the smallest uh, dimension you could possibly have claimed if you didn't matter that it was you were lying. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the lies are large for many of these manufacturers. In the end, all we can actually do is count the number of transistors on a piece of silicon. So. <laughs> you didn't get something staggeringly complicated 
Um, 6502 has almost no registers. It keeps a lot of stuff in memory, um, zero page for anybody who's ever programmed it. Um, it takes substantial amounts of time to do even the simplest things. You know, a whole microsecond to do that. You can only do a million of those a second. And obviously it takes a genius like David Braben or somebody to um, be involved to write to elite um, using a microprocessor as poor as this. Um, but it was all we had at the time, and we were quite happy. When we came to um, design the ARM, uh, we could use a lot more transistors. Now, even though we, we changed sort of um, technology uh, from uh, 6502, which is actually a complex instruction set for computer, um, the complexity isn't in the complexity of the instructions. When we differentiate between complex instruction set computers and reduced instruction set computers, what, what we're talking about is the complexity of the instruction decoding and how it's executed. That's what we, we, we mean. So 6502, remarkably simple instruction set. Surely that isn't a complex instruction set computer, but it is. And ARM, a substantially more complicated uh, instruction set as it would appear, but it's a reduced instruction set computer because the complexity of decoding instructions much, much simpler than it was before. And we can use 25,000 transistors now. Gordon Moore's wheel has turned, we can use them more. And this is what you get, um, another eye shot. Substantially prettier. I think you can see immediately that there's structure in this. This is because uh, hand layout, uh, when you're designing big structures, gives you interesting properties. For, uh, if, if you remember the uh, picture of the 6502, you could see some stuff in there, there were regular things, but the 6502 design is so messy that there's no metastructure. ARM's design is quite clean and clear, and thus the metastructure gives you some very obvious um, things. On the left is Steve Ferber's original pencil sketch of the data path of the ARM, and now a historical document of its own mind. So, what do we get with these 25,000 transistors? Oops, I've gone the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. It's going We get a machine that's substantially faster, the transistors are faster, and we have enough transistors to pipeline the whole processor, rather than just the instruction decoder as the 6502. So, can we just explain what pipeline is? Pipeline, yeah. Um, Processors don't run at the clock speeds you think they do. Um, so when we advertise a processor as running at 8 megahertz, it takes many more steps than one single 8 megahertz clock tick to execute an instruction in its entirety. So um, we need to do several fundamental things to do an instruction on this processor. We needed to fetch it from memory. We needed to decode it. We needed to read the register file, um, execute those, the, the actual functionality required, and then write the result back to the register file. And uh, we call the process of overlapping all those steps pipelining. So if we do a fetch while we do a decode and execute, while we do a write, if we put those things underneath each other again and again, then every cycle we can start the next fetch while the previous decode is going and the previous previous execute is going. And that's pipelining. And pipelining causes a lot of transistors to be used. More and more state is held in the processor because obviously it's thinking about things twice. We, we, we fetch the instruction, then we decoded the instruction and pass that decoded data on to another guy who did the execution while we fetch another one. So we've got state twice, and those pipe like that pipeline state costs us lots of transistors. So on very simple processes built with low numbers of transistors, we simply can't afford to pipeline very much. As we've been given more and more transistors, we've been able to put more and more sophisticated pipeline architectures underneath things, many more stages. If we can cut things up more finely, then we can run the thing faster. So this is three-stage pipeline. So it goes fetch, decode, execute, write. 
those are, those are its um, stages. If we went fetch, decode, register, execute, write, that's a five stage one, and we can run faster because each stage is now doing less work. And so the more highly pipeline you make your processor, the faster it goes. And the more transistors we burn and the more power we burn. So it's all about finding the balance. So with 25,000 transistors, we can make a three-stage pipeline processor. So running at 8 megahertz with a 3 micron transistor, the 3 micron transistor was about twice as fast as the transistors they used to build the 6502. But the 6502 only ran at 2 megahertz. If, we, if we'd scaled just on the transistor's performance going from, from one to the other, we'd have only been running at 4 megahertz now. But we were also able to spend the transistors to be pipelined. And that powerism, that internal powerism inside the machine made it faster. Everybody else can model off. <laughs> so pipelining makes the processor run faster, but we burn transistors. We've also got enough transistors to make the data paths much, much wider. So our fundamental operation in an ARM compared to the 6502 can much more interesting for programming pur purposes. We have a 32 bit operation, we can add register 1 to register 2 and put the result in register 0, and that can be done. You can start a new one of those every 8 megahertz clock trick. It doesn't take only a, uh, one 8 megahertz clock trick, it takes three to actually do it. The latency is three, but we can start a new one every clock trick. It's 37 square millimetres in size, so it's a bit larger. Um, shrinking from 6 to 3, getting four times as many transistors in the same area, isn't enough to bur burn 25,000 transistors in the same area that somebody was burning four. Um, so we are a bit bigger in this thing I can process. But the picture of an arm, this is an arm 2, arm 2 AS. Um, same blocks, same buses, connected around the place, block at the right hand side, same instruction decode and control where all the stuff is done. Um, the buses grew to 32 bits wide, whereas they were 8 bits wide on the 65 bit 2. Um, the dressers are 24 bits wide, where they were 16 bits wide before, and so on. So, same sort of diagram, well, simpler diagram than 65 by 2s, but much more going on in the surface. Um, the project that made ARM, we were concerned about being able to program things. It took a David Rabin and Ian Bell together to write elites, and they had to slave over using 6502. It was really hard. We wanted people to be able to write games as complex as elite, but to do it much more easily, or even to use a high level language instead of having to write it in machine code. That was one of the rationales for going up in compute performance so much. When we made ARM, it was one of the most powerful microprocessors anybody had devised. Substantially more powerful than the SIS. But that was a long time ago, and you may have noticed that there have been more transistors provided then. What does an instruction set designer do when she's given more transistors than that? So this is a fire path processor. Um, this is what happens when you're allowed to use six million transistors on the instruction set designer. Fire path also is burning some transistors on uh, a better pipelining implementation. This thing has an eight-stage pipeline. So it does burn some pipeline transistors, but substantially, with 8 million transistors, we can have a much more complex instruction set than you see. Um, most of the processors people in the room use have simple instruction sets with vastly complicated implementations. This is what happens <coughs> if you are given a lot of transistors to use and making the most complex instruction set you'd like to. You can see that there's still some structure in here, but six million transistors, there's far too many to show. The pictures go a bit blurry. Um, this is 
125 nanometer, I think, and 30 nanometer. Um, so it's actually quite hard to take an optical picture of it. Um, the obvious things, there were, there were buses missing about the place, these big yellow striped radiator looking things, they're the register files, two of them. Um, you can sort of see that the top and bottom are the same. Part of this processor is built by replication, and then down the middle is all the control logic. But that's quite complicated, so we usually look at a much simpler picture of it. So Firepath is a long instruction word processor. It runs really quite fast. Um, the 130 nanometer transistor process that it was built on gives quite fast transistors, and it's deeply pipelined. So 330 megahertz. It's designed to execute four 64-bit operations per cycle. Pipeline, remember, you can start a new one of these every cycle, but they take multiple cycles to actually work. So um, an example of a fire path instruction. This isn't a compound instruction or anything else. This is a single instruction that the processor executes in one go. So it says, add, I kept this to adds, but that could have been a multiply. The fire path is full of multipliers as well. So take a register pair R2, R3, register pair R4, R5, add every separate subword of that, those registers and put the result back in R2, R0, while at the same time, in the same instruction, loading the register pair R6, R7 using the address you found in R8. And it can do that continually every cycle. So you can design instruction sets at a high level um, that take a lot of complexity and do a lot of work in one go. It's quite small, 70 millimeters. So even though I use 6 million transistors, the transistors have shrunk rather a lot. Where did this fit in the history of things? Uh, VLIW and LIW processors are a little bit rare in the histories of things. The history is written by people who sell lots, Intel. Was this one ever actually made or sold by? Oh yes, oh. Firepath is made and sold. If you have an ADSL line anywhere in the world, there's about a 90% chance that there's a Firepath at the other end of it. Oh. Firepath uh, is also used in um, set-top boxes and inside TV chips, um, in femto cells, in power line modems, and lots of other things. Um, we sell about 90 million firepaths a year. Uh, well, probably more actually. That's, that's a little bit out of date. About 130 million firepaths a year. So, yes, this, this is an active chip. I'm only allowed to talk about obsolete ones, however, which is why this is from 2003. Um, so, firepath is quite interesting. It's similarly throughout. So, our, our block description of the machine. Everything is single instruction, multiple data. So it has 64 bit data paths through it, and afford lots of transistors on widths of things. And we can afford to do byte, half, word, and long versions of every instruction. So it's got a massive instruction set. Um, and as I said earlier, it can do multiplies just as cheaply as anything else. So that could be a mol, or indeed that could even be mol b, in which case. That single operation is doing 16 byte multipliers, and you can have one of those every instruction. Um, but firepaths are used for signal processing, so they end up doing an awful lot of that sort of thing, which is why it's worth spending the transistors. Um, so, what do you do after that? It's pretty difficult to complexify an instruction set beyond firepaths level of instruction. Um, so inevitably, if somebody gives you more transistors, you tend to say, I put down more microprocessors then. So this is a die um, with two microprocessors on. There's one, one going the other way. Um, it's typical of a die uh, for any of the modern signal processing world in that it basically contains microprocessors and memory. All these regular single-colored blocks are large slabs of memory. 
And most of the interesting parts you take apart look pretty much like this. So we burned some transistors and used up two fire packs worth of transistors, six million transistors ago. Um, and we keep going out, we keep giving, being given more and more transistors. So what do we do next? Uh, okay. Four, four microprocessors. <coughs> 2006 version, 65 nanometers. Um, the fire packs are there. And there's, there's more memory, and there, there's very little else than memory in the fire packs or something like this. So, can we keep doing this? What happens if somebody gives me more and more um, transistors to spend on a microprocessor? Well, I run into a problem. Gene Andal observed, and this really is a law, it's got equations behind it and everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you've got a single problem to do, the speed up of multiple processes is limited by the sequential part of the problem. Equation. Right past the equation and look at the graph. So, let's take something that we think of as trivially parallelizable. Um, Ray tracing is a very good, trivially parallelizable application. In, in that, the, the <coughs> work for every beam of light that you do is separate. They have a common back end model that you're trying to ray trace, and there's some synchronization. So there is a bit of serial control around it. Uh, it there's about 5% of, of your workload. So, what does it mean? to say, we'll take this trivially parallelizable ray tracing application and run it on as many processes as we like. What happens to our performance? Well, at first it's great, we keep adding pro processes and our performance keeps going up. And then, oh, the performance stops going up anymore. So the, the equation basically says that the limit of performance gain is dominated, so 95% parallel, that 5% means that you can only get 20x speed up, no matter how many processes you add, 65,000, you still only get 20x speed up. And in fact, the parallel part is so horrid that it even takes you 2048 processes, not 20, to get 20x speed up. That's essentially this line up here. So that's pretty bad. But ray tracing is an unusual application, it really is really parallel. What happens if we look at something a bit less parallel? What happens if we look at something that's, say, three quarters parallel? What does Andel's law mean then? Yes, that's this purple line. Oh, gosh. Oh, wait a minute, that's 90% parallel. No, three quarters is the red line. So, 90% parallel, we're limited at 10x. Three quarters parallel, we're limited at 4x. Three quarters of your application can be parallelized, and one quarter can't. You can only go four times faster, ever. In fact, if you're only 50-50, you've got half your application serial and half parallel, you can only go twice as fast, no matter how many processes you apply. That's pretty bad news, really. Um, the industry settled down into what I call the multi-core consensus. And the industry can and will continue to make uh, pieces of silicon with more and more parallel computers on them. They'll sell you as many primary processes as they can sell you, as many graphics processors, graphics being one of these truly parallelizable things, as many special purpose processors, and that's going to be a problem because it's just not going to go very much faster. Traditional scale of computation hasn't been increasing for a while. If you've got something that's entirely serial, it just hasn't been going any faster for quite a long time. Since about 2006, your serial task has gone roughly the same speed. Um, things have changed a lot. I mean, the transistors we're getting are much more power efficient, but they're not a great deal faster, and that's a problem. Worse is to come. Um, scale of programming languages, C, JavaScript, Ruby, whatever you like, anything that's built on a scalar paradigm is a very poor work. We can do it for certain problem domains and 
they are very limited. Um, we can, we're trying to force people to accept things like OpenCL, um, things that are explicitly parallel to start with, because that makes it much easier to run them on the multi-core machines. So uh, we need a re big revolution in software even to make use of this. You might think that that was bad enough news, but there's worse to come. <laughs> So transistors have been getting more and more power efficient, but we use so many more of them in a small space, so things are getting hot. How hot? Well, here's a graph showing the thermal density of microprocessors. It's drawn by Intel, so it contains Intel processors. Um, you can see that things just carried on for a while. They were making things that were increasingly hot, until they got to the heat of a hot plate and beyond to Pentium 2, then Pentium 3, and then Pentium 4. Everybody who remembers the Netverse microarchitecture will know that Pentium 4 was a hideous mistake for Intel. Um, and they're now well below the line, but still heading towards as hot as a nuclear re reactor with a rocket nozzle um, not that far away. Um, Pentium 4 broke Intel. They couldn't do it. They, they had assumed that they could make processors run faster and faster and faster. And they had to stop, um, throw away the Pentium 4 microarchitecture entirely, and go back, in fact, to this processor and create a new version of it, because it was substantially more power efficient than those things were. And that new thing is what's underneath the core. Processes. So the, the, these are core 2 euros, core i7s, which we go right on. So there is a problem. We can't get rid of heat in any particular way. So as, as we approach the sort of 100 watt per square centimetre, it's just impractical. Getting rid of that amount of heat is too difficult. So that the, the power density constrains the designs that we make. But it also constrains the future in a very bad way. If we look into the future, power constrains it too. So we've got this core, um, we've got our core i7s, and they're using too much power now as well. They use the most efficient microarchitecture, Intel has refined the microarchitecture again and again. It's refined the transistor model, and um, size reduction of transistors has made them more power efficient. We're putting multiple gates, Intel called them multi-gates, other people call them finfets because fins stick up vertically in the design of the thing. It's no longer a flat world. Um, these are all to make them Transistors not faster, but more power efficient. But even so, we're using so many more transistors in such a small space, <laughs> but it's a problem. As we go forward, we won't be able to turn our silicon on. Um, eight nanometers, somewhere in 2024. Over half the dive will have to be dark. Now, we're sort of used to our phones not running their uh, microprocessors flat out all the time. But this says even if we give 125 watt power into the die and the cooling method to get the 125 watts of heat away from it, we still have to turn half the die off most of the time, otherwise it's going to melt. So power and this thing called dark silicon defines some of our futures in bad ways. Um, there are obvious ways to react to this. Design your system so it's got a heterogeneous array of microprocessors. Um, put down special purpose of microprocessors for every eventuality. Leave them turned off until you actually need them. So one of the ways that ARM deals with this is to have what it calls big little architectures. So you put down very big cores that can run very, very fast. And then you just put in lots of little very power efficient cores. Big cores get a lot, lot of work done but not fundamentally power efficient. Little cores, use them most of the time when you don't need the breakneck speed. 
that's just a, a reaction to this, and it will happen more and more as we go forward. More special purpose processes will get bundled in to make up for the fact that most of the time we're going to have to turn everything off. But, it's worse than that. <laughs> so, we have some economic problems, do you Economics has begun to rear its head for a little while. Um, when we hit about 40 nanometers, design engineers and design engineer managers started to complain really quite a lot of how expensive this game was. Um, in 28 nanometers, it cost something like six to ten million dollars to make a mass set, about 50 million dollars to design a chip. So this has got to be a very expensive game. Um, we're pushing on. Um, we've got advanced chips on 20 nanometer, 20 nanometer chips in my laptop. Um, Samsung just brought out a 20 nanometer chip for mobile phones. Intel just on the crux, as they have been for ooh, well over a year now, of bringing out 14 nanometer chips from a processor called Broadwell Y, um, which will be um, the core M um, architecture machines. So we're able to push on. It's getting very hard, it's getting very expensive. And as we go down, something bad's happening. We get more transistors on the die, but they cost more. The die is becoming so expensive. To make 14 nanometer, Intel had to use not only a very expensive mass, set of masks to make it, but many of the metal layers, they had to have another set of masks, what's called double patterned, to get the, things exposed properly on the 14 nanometer um, design using 193 nanometer light. They need to put down the mask and put down another mask on top of it in order to shine increasingly small holes and get rid of the contraction effects. So that's called double patterning. And it just means more and more expensive mass sets. And with more and more expensive materials used to build the vertical fin frets um, and all the different layers of stuff in a chip, um, the die themselves are going up in cost all the time. And now we're seeing that we can make smaller, better transistors, but they cost more. So we're going to begin to see people flattening out. Um, another thing happened to Intel in 14 nanometer which was it took much longer. It took Intel three years to get from 22 nanometer to 14 nanometer. And if they aren't in volume production of it by the end of this year, it will take them three and a half years, because that does seem likely. So this, this is sort of, I say sort of the end of Moore's law. Um, it's getting really expensive per transistor. Um, for Intel, they make a world out of really expensive transistors. They've been able to make their 40 nanometer transistors a bit cheaper than their 20 nanometer transistors. As part of the die itself, costing much more, the transistors are a little bit cheaper. Um, but Intel started from a historic, high, highly expensive transistor point. And for companies that make cheap transistors like TSMC or Global Pandas, um, that's not true, and we really are going to see, as we shrink from 28 to 20 to 16 or 14, transistors are going to cost more. And that's going to change the world in some really catastrophic ways. No longer will <coughs> companies be able to bring out uh, a design expecting to shrink it and make their money back in the future. Um, many companies are going to be able to come down here anyway really expensive. So that's sort of where I ought to be closing for questions and things, but I've got two more slides. <laughs> Predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. Um, in April 2002, the head of Intel predicted 30 gigahertz, 10 billion transistor chips by 2010. And we've seen some of the reasons that didn't happen. This is the graph they stood up with. Um, 2002, it got to there, and they knew that Pentium 4 was coming out, so it just predicted straight up there, and obviously that was immediately before, like that. So, 
it's hard to make these predictions. Um, I don't claim to be particularly precise about them, but I'm trying to give you some sort of idea of the character of what's going to come, which is this thing. A future of heterogeneous microprocessors and graphics processors means lots of work for processors and system on chip designs. That's me. And even more work for software people, because they need to catch up badly. And even so, um, we've seen massive gains in performance over the years. But that's just not going to be repeated. If you're buying computers today, expecting them to be n times faster than they used to be, when they happen, might be more portable, might use less power, might have longer battery life. Yeah, I can have a really powerful laptop with octal core processor in it all the time. It's executed in instruction by instruction, but lots of things are going on all the time. We just zoomed into the register file so we can see um, this is one bit in the register file. You can see lines being read and written. This thing is the valve shifter. And I'll responsible for shifting things. These are the instruction decoders. Their PLA is just like 6502s and they're substantially similar. So you can see as the green line across lights up to decode the instruction. And then we're looking at um, the priority encoder that does load multiple store multiple instructions. So this one on the top. And then as we come to the edge of the chip, um, you can see instructions being fed down from instruction decoder earlier and the It will do it again. Right, um, I only that over a little bit. There's time for some questions. potential to change the landscape in like microprocessors, do you think uh, it might you know, make them obsolete eventually? There are no quantum computers yet. Well, D-Wave, Google's D